Good to be in a bigger room, good to see all of you here, and uh, trust this will be a good session today. Uh, we do want to uh, start out the uh, first presentation today that I have the privilege of bringing is on recently completed research uh, that we conducted at TTI for NCHRP, Project 3-102 on uh, left turn lane design, and uh, again briefly acknowledge uh, Kay Fitzpatrick, who was the PI of that project. Um, We'll, we'll talk at the end about how you can actually get this report. It is published. We finished this report uh, and project about a year ago. And so this is some of our findings and some of the things that we did on the project. Uh, the objective of the project uh, was to uh, develop uh, recommendations for uh, potential revisions and improvements to the Ashto Green Book as it relates to design guidance for auxiliary lanes, specifically left turn auxiliary lanes, uh, at approaches to signalized intersections. Uh, briefly, what we did in the project, um, we, we conducted literature review, looked at uh, what was then ongoing research to see what was uh, uh, currently going on and, and other initiatives that would overlap or possibly uh, feed into our um, analysis. Uh, we did a, a short task where we interviewed DOT practitioners to find out what their current practices were and some of the things that they had observed. Uh, both of those first efforts then fed into our uh, initiative to try to focus on what issues we really wanted to emphasize in phase two of the project. As we completed that, then, uh, we came out with two operational studies that we did in that project, a double left turn lane study and a deceleration lane study. Um, and then we, of course, wrote it up in that report that I mentioned a while ago. Uh, this presentation will focus on those last two items, the deceleration study and uh, the resulting recommendations from that uh, that are in the report. Uh, just as a bit of background, uh, we, of course, looked at what is currently in the Ashto Green Book in Chapter 9 when it where it discusses uh, intersection design. And there is a fair amount of information there in the text and, and supporting figures, but what was most pertinent to what we are doing uh, were two items. One was Table 9-22, and I boiled it down to just the, the two columns of, of interest, uh, the selected speed limits in 10 mile per hour increments and the related uh, distances for uh, full deceleration length. And then the accompanying figure, uh, figure-948, uh, that has a few dimensions to go along with it, and there's notes and footnotes and supporting information to go with those in the Green Book uh, on those pages in Chapter 9 uh, to help the designer. But what we wanted to look at then was how, how did we get to those numbers? Where did they come from? What, what purpose uh, where they, will they help us serve? What's the relationship to those? And in looking at the literature, we found that there's quite a variety of deceleration rates that have been proposed and that may even be in use in different jurisdictions across the country. Um, in CHRP Report 400 uh, in 1997, Fambro and others uh, developed the value of 11.2 feet per second squared for stopping sight distance uh, and about twice that much for maximum or emergency braking. Uh, the IT Traffic Engineering Handbook, the 99 edition, uh, also uses 11.2 uh, as a maximum and says that up to 10 feet per second squared is reasonably comfortable. More recently, uh, Gates and others in a study in Michigan uh, collected field data and they found that for the vehicles they observed um, at two different speed classes, above 40 and below 40 miles an hour, they came up with some different results uh, with uh, deceleration rates of 9.2, 10.9, and 13.6 feet per second for the 15th, 50th, and 85th percentiles. Uh, less than 40 miles an hour, uh, those were reduced by, by 2 to 3 feet per second squared. So that's more recent uh, information suggesting that there may be some changes uh, in the way that our current drivers and our current vehicle fleet may be operating on our deceleration lanes. Keeping all of that in mind and feeding all that into our, into our information and, and the foundation for our phase two study, we came up with three questions that we wanted to emphasize uh, as we collected the data and analyzed it for this study. First was, what really is the speed differential for turning vehicles? The Green Book mentions a 10 mile per hour speed difference um, as a guideline between through vehicles and turning vehicles um, as the turning vehicles enter the turning lane. And we wanted to know how, how realistic that was. We also wanted to know how speed differential varied based on the taper length and or the posted speed limit. Um, we have um, 
we have an indication that you know those are influential but to what extent does does that actually happen and then are the rates that are shown um, in those tables and figures that I that I showed earlier in the 2011 Green Book are they representative of what current left turn drivers are doing um, so we collected a lot of data uh, we in order to look for our study sites uh, we set up several controls first off of all was the taper length we use that as our benchmark uh, the green book gives two uh, taper rates the 8 to 1 rate for speeds uh, in our case up to 45 miles an hour that we used and then 15 to 1 for speeds above 50, 50 and above and for a 12 foot lane then uh, you end up with a 96 foot length or 180 foot length uh, respectively we looked at a variety of speed limits for our sites from 30 to 65 miles an hour. All of our sites uh, were, were four-leg intersections. They were all signalized. Uh, they all had four lanes on the major road. Uh, there was a variety between two and four, la four lanes on the minor. And all of them were roughly straight and level and no skew to help minimize any effects of that on deceleration behavior. Uh, this is a kind of a summary of the sites that we used. We, we have a, a matrix that we had set up based on posted speed limit and taper length categories. We were shooting for two sites in each cell. We almost got there. Uh, we ended up with a total of 12 sites at which we uh, analyzed data. Um, three sites each in, in uh, cities in Alabama, Florida, Mississippi, and in Texas uh, to get at some geographical diversity and variety in our, in our driver population and our data. Primarily our data uh, came from video. Uh, we, uh, we towed our TTI video trailer uh, up and down I-10 and uh, got some, some good video of, of uh, the entire length of a lot of different um, deceleration lanes and approaches to uh, the, the intersection with some key points um, shown where we also collected supplemental data with counters, LIDAR, and other information to help support the data that we were pulling off of the video. But primarily we used the video to um, record how fast drivers were covering certain distances and translated that into speeds. The data analysis we had focused on three key guidelines from the Green Book related to the three questions I mentioned earlier. First of all, uh, the guideline of a 10 mile per hour differential when the turning vehicle clears the through traffic lane. That's note three in table 922 that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the next item was the 5.8 feet per second squared average deceleration rate. The Green Book mentions for drivers that are turning into the turning lane um, around the taper. And then the uh, last item was the six and a half foot de decelerate, six and a half feet per second deceleration rate uh, after drivers complete their lane change into the turning lane. Looking at each one of those in turn, first of all, we looked at the speed differential. And what we found was, um, comparing to that 10 mile per hour value, um, we only found not quite half of the vehicles we observed actually had that kind of a differential. It was only about 46%. Um, a similar number had between 10 and 20 miles an hour, and we even had some above 20 and above 30 uh, as far as the turning vehicle speed being different from the adjacent through vehicles. Um, it was so much of a difference, in fact, that it was a statistically significant predictor of the deceleration rate. Um, and uh, we found, in particular, that at our higher speed sites is where those higher differentials appeared. Um, comparing that, then, to what the Green Book says, we did not find any strong statistical relationship between the deceleration length and the speed differential. And, kind of the scattershot of, of uh, data here comparing those two shows there's really not a pattern at all. It was pretty well uh, all across the board. Um, and so we did not see the relationship between those two that, that is kind of uh, suggested in the Green Book guidance to go along with, uh, with those lengths. Looking then at vehicles deceleration upstream of the taper or as they're entering the uh, left turn lane, uh, again, the, uh, the Green Book value is 5.8 feet per second squared. We found actually that about half of the drivers we observed were at 6.1 feet per second or more, and then 85% of our high-speed drivers were at least 4.2 feet per second squared, uh, indicating that people had a lot more gradual deceleration as they approached the lane. Maybe they were coasting, just letting their foot off the gas, uh, or maybe they were just starting their deceleration earlier. Uh, but we found that the 5.8 did not necessarily hold for the drivers that we observed. 
And the Green Book guidelines recognize that there is an influence of speed. Um, the, the higher speed you have, uh, the, the, uh, the way that may change your deceleration rate is, is considered, but yet the decel rates and lengths are not directly linked to speed um, in the information provided in the Green Book. The guidelines are flexible for sites that have speeds between 30 and 50 mile an hour, and they do allow the designer to consider other site characteristics as appropriate. But what we found was that for that first stage of deceleration, a rate of 4.2 feet per second squared in and around the taper better matches the uh, drivers that we observed, especially at the high speed sites, and uh, more closely resembles the behavior that they were already doing. Um, of course, there are trade-offs. If you have a higher rate or a shorter length, it does affect um, how your drivers will operate. If you shorten the length, obviously people have to either um, make that lane change in a shorter distance and at a higher deceleration rate, or they start their decelerations earlier, which may mean, again, they're coasting in the lane or they're hitting their brake earlier and causing those larger speed differentials in the through lane, uh, which is not necessarily desired. Looking then at the deceleration in the deceleration lane, after they've completed the lane change, what are they doing? And we did find that the six and a half feet per second was actually not too bad. About half of our low speed drivers and 85% of our high speed drivers were at or above six and a half feet per second. Um, and so that was a fairly realistic uh, benchmark as far as the data was concerned that we collected. Comparing that again to what the Green Book says, uh, the Green Book says that it is not practical to provide the full deceleration length in many locations. It, it does acknowledge the fact that there may be right-of-way constraints or other things that prohibit providing that full length. And most of our study sites did not have uh, that full length as recommended by the Green Book. We did the calculations and a lot of our sites were, uh, were shorter uh, than what was recommended. But what we did find is that both deceleration length and vehicle speed were statistically significant predictors of the deceleration rate. So much so that we found a relationship of about uh, two feet per second, two tenths of a foot per second squared uh, as a result of a 10 foot increase in the deceleration length. So if you want to help your drivers get to where they're going, provide more length, allows them to make a more gradual deceleration. And two-tenths may not seem like a lot, but when you're talking about a, a benchmark of six and a half, two-tenths can add up with another 10 and another 10 and another 10 um, to help your drivers out if you have that uh, space available to provide it. So as we move into uh, the recommended changes for the Green Book that we made based on this study, two key things that we wanted to point out. First of all, we recommended a revision to figure 948 to help clarify the dimensions that were there and to describe what those links and those different points on along the lane meant. And so better understanding what a perception reaction distance might be, uh, the lane change and deceleration distance is described as such, and then uh, providing also for storage distance where it is possible. And so uh, we revised this figure, we included that in our submission both to TRB and to AASHTO so that they could include that. Uh, in their consideration for uh, the next revision of the Green Book if they so desire, and the, the technical committee does have access to that now that the report has been published. Go along with the new table then, uh, excuse me, the new figure I just showed you is a revised table. And we recommended two different uh, sets of values for, again, deceleration and lane change distance combined. Uh, and we recommended a typical, which still has a two-stage deceleration, uh, using 4.2 2 and 6.5 feet per second, and then a constrained where, again, right away or other, other constraints may prohibit providing that full length. And the constrained values are fairly similar to what is currently shown in the Green Book, uh, but in our new table we also filled in the, uh, the multiples of five on the speed limit as well to provide extra information to the, to the designer. Again, uh, this is now available. It's published as NCHRP Report 780. Uh, the report has been complete. You can find it at that location. And I'll leave this up here for a moment and stop. If we have time for some questions, uh, Dale will take that as well.